It's hard to believe it's been almost 20 years since that fateful summer I spent as a park ranger in the remote forests of Northern California. I was 22 and had just graduated from UC Davis with a degree in environmental science. Being young and eager to make my mark, I jumped at the seasonal position doing trail maintenance and giving nature tours in the Trinity Alps wilderness. The drive up to the ranger station gave me my first taste of the area's isolation. After passing Weaverville, the last major town for over a hundred miles, I followed winding mountain roads through densely wooded hills. Occasionally I'd pass a lonely house or a trailhead packed with cars belonging to weekend backpackers. But mostly it was just my little Volkswagen and the staggering view of rugged, untamed nature. After two hours, I reached the ranger station, a simple A-frame cabin and shop nestled in a high alpine valley. The place was staffed seasonally with only two permanent rangers and four college kids like me, hired to help manage the trails and lead visitor tours. My fellow seasonal ranger, Wendy, showed me around the small compound. Cell service is pretty much non-existent up here. Even the radio and satellite phone cut in and out with these mountains, she explained. Our sleeping quarters were in a bunkhouse out back, while the main cabin served as an office, radio room, and kitchen. After stowing my gear in the bunkhouse, I joined Wendy on a short hike to familiarize myself with the landscape. Dense fir and cedar forests clung to steep slopes that shot up on all sides to bare rocky peaks. Snow still lingered in shady ravines and melt-swollen creeks tumbled down from glaciers hanging above distant valleys. This was true wilderness, a rare and magical place. Over the next week, I fell into a routine. Waking before dawn to help maintain trails, then doing patrols or leading tourist groups on nature hikes in the afternoons. The days were long and physically demanding, but immensely rewarding. Each night I'd collapse satisfied into my bunk. On my days off, I enjoyed exploring the backcountry on my own. The solitude and sweeping vistas were sublime. One Sunday, I set out to climb Mount Eddy, a 9,000-foot peak with a commanding view. The route up followed switchbacks through flower-strewn meadows, then a boulder field to the windswept summit. At the top, the world unfolded below in an endless wrinkled carpet of green forest and gray stone. I sat for an hour watching the sunlight slowly slide down distant peaks. The hike had taken all day, and by the time I descended, the sun was brushing the treetops. I quickened my pace, hoping to reach the ranger station before darkness fell completely. These mountains became disorienting at night. But within a half mile I had lost the trail and wandered into a dense stand of trees. My anxiety rose as the last light faded. Strange noises echoed around me. Was that a branch breaking? My heart pounded, senses pinging for any slight movement in the brush. Realizing I was working myself into a panic, I stopped and took a deep breath. I calmed my mind and headed downhill, eventually picking up the trail. By the time the ranger station lights appeared, I was exhausted and sweating, but the relief was tremendous. After that, I made sure to leave ample time to get out of the backcountry before sunset. As June neared its end, more hikers began appearing in the high country, seeking early season adventures. Each week our workload increased as we prepared campsites and maintained trails for the coming summer crush. One afternoon my radio crackled with a call that a visitor had injured themselves falling into a creek up on Mount Eddy. I hiked up the switchbacks to the reported location, arriving in under an hour thanks to my knowledge of the trail. The woman had badly sprained her ankle and couldn't put weight on it. I helped her slowly limp down to the trailhead, where her worried husband waited. My supervisor commended me for the quick response. Word of the incident must have gotten around because, in the following days, I noticed more hikers on the Mount Eddy Trail, eyeing me with recognition and gratitude. It felt good helping people appreciate these wild places while staying safe. Our small crew was run off our feet managing the crowds, cleaning sites, answering questions, and rescuing the occasional hiker who bit off more than they could chew. I was proud of how we all worked together as a team to meet the challenge. By Sunday evening, the holiday crowds had vanished as quickly as they'd appeared. 
We collapsed in the bunkhouse, all looking forward to the slower weeks of midsummer. But that week, everything would change. I was ten miles into my weekly patrol of the northern trails when I first spotted the man stumbling along the path. His skinny body was hunched over, struggling against some invisible force. Even from a distance I could tell he was in bad shape. Hey there, I called out. Are you okay? The man jerked his head up with the panic of an animal hearing a predator's footsteps. His eyes were sunken and bloodshot. He opened his mouth as if to respond, but only a choked gurgle came out. I rushed over just as his legs started to give out. Whoa! Easy now! I've got you! I grabbed the man under his shoulders before he could collapse completely. He was disturbingly gaunt under his torn, filthy clothing. Monsters! He croaked. Coming! For me! Look at me! I said firmly. You're safe now. I'm Park Ranger Laura. I'm going to help you, okay? The man's breathing came in ragged gasps. I needed to get some food and water into him quickly before he went into shock. I lowered him onto a flat rock at the side of the trail. I unscrewed my canteen and held it to his cracked lips. Small sips, I instructed. After a few swallows, he went into a coughing fit, but color started to return to his grayish face. I dug some trail mix out of my pack and managed to coax him into eating a handful of the nuts and raisins. As his initial delirium passed, the man seemed to focus on me for the first time. Thank you, he croaked. I'm... Nice to meet you, Chris, I said with an encouraging smile. Now, just rest for a minute. You're going to be okay. But Chris's eyes took on a vacant, haunted look again. No, it's still coming. I can feel it. His voice dropped to a frantic whisper. There are things in these woods. Evil things. I glanced uneasily at the silent trees surrounding us. Chris, look at me. You were lost in the woods, right? It can play tricks on your mind out here. He seized my arm with unexpected strength. You have to believe me, he pleaded. I saw it take James. Oh God, the screaming. Who's James? I asked gently. When Chris just stared ahead in mute horror, I tried again. What did you see? Chris's whole body began to tremble. The monster. Pale flesh, razor claws, dot dot dot, it dragged him away into the darkness. He trailed off as his eyes darted around wildly. The poor man was clearly very traumatized, but whether his ramblings were from some real experience or mental break I couldn't be sure. For now, I just needed to keep him calm. Okay, take deep breaths, I soothed. We'll get you out of here soon. I'm going to call for a helicopter evacuation. I stepped away and radioed in our coordinates requesting emergency transport. The dispatcher said the weather prevented air access until the following morning. We'd have to hunker down here tonight. As the sun dipped below the ridge line, I gathered wood and kindling to start a fire. Its crackling warmth seemed to lull Chris into a daze. I boiled water and made us both hot soup from my rations. When he finished eating, I spread out my sleeping bag and mat. You should rest, I said. Chris didn't resist as I eased him down. His eyes were already fluttering closed from exhaustion, but he continued to mumble disjointedly. It won't stop. Coming for me. Found me again. I squeezed his hand. Sleep. No one's going to hurt you now. He was out in minutes. I added more wood to the fire and leaned against a log facing him. The last rays of the sun faded away, leaving us cloaked in darkness. I checked that my pistol was loaded and within reach. Not that I really thought I'd need protection from monsters. Poor Chris had just cracked under exposure and hunger. Still, his raving sent a shiver through me. I peered out into the impenetrable night, pressing in around our camp. With the firelight dancing eerily on the trees, I couldn't escape the feeling of sinister eyes watching us. The next morning, I was up before dawn, anxious to get Chris safely evacuated. The poor man clearly needed medical care and psychiatric counseling. Part of me wondered if it really was all in his head or if something truly sinister lurked in these woods. But I pushed those thoughts aside as the distant thrum of chopper blades approached. Right on schedule, the rescue helicopter appeared above the treetops. I gently shook Chris awake and helped him stand on wobbly legs. It's time to go. The helicopter is here for you, I said. Chris gripped my arm, eyes darting around fearfully. Do you hear it? 
The monster's close. I can feel it watching. You're safe now, I promise. I kept my voice calm and led him firmly towards the clearing. No more monsters. You're going to the hospital. He stayed huddled against me as we ducked under the whirring blades. Once Chris was buckled into a seat, I stepped back and gave him a reassuring wave. But as the chopper lifted off the ground, Chris screamed over the deafening engine. It sees me! Oh God, it's coming! His hysterical pleas faded away as the helicopter rose over the treetops and sped off. I stood watching it disappear, my heart aching for the broken man inside. With a heavy sigh, I turned and headed back down the trail alone. Chris clearly had severe psychological trauma, though whether it was based in reality or delusion, I couldn't be sure. I said a silent prayer for his recovery. As I hiked, a strange unease crept over me. The forest was eerily still and watchful. I shook off the feeling, quickening my pace. Chris's ramblings were affecting me more than I cared to admit. Focus, I told myself. You know these woods like the back of your hand. A raven's cry made me jump. Get a grip, Laura. Still, I couldn't ignore the prickle on my neck, like unseen eyes tracking me. I glared into the underbrush defiantly. See, nothing there. You're letting fear get the best of you. By late afternoon, the silence felt suffocating. I paused, turning in a slow circle. Nothing looked amiss, yet my instincts screamed something was wrong. I fumbled for my radio, but got only static. Swallowing hard, I continued on, pacing my breaths. A crack of snapping branches whipped me around, hand on my holster. Adrenaline spiked through me. Easy girl, probably just a deer. Still, I quickened my steps. The trees themselves seemed to creep nearer, light fading as their limbs wove tighter overhead. Another sharp crack exploded, even closer. I broke into a run, my heart hammering against my ribs. The trail tunneled ahead into featureless darkness. Rasping breaths echoed my own. Glimpses of pale, sinewy movement flashed between the trees. No, I realized with dizzying horror. Those weren't echoes. Something was right behind me. I screamed as a dark shape hurtled past within inches, putting on an impossible burst of speed. The radio was useless. No one was coming to help. I needed to hide. Now. I veered off the trail into the brush. Thorns and branches lashed my skin as I crashed through the undergrowth. Finding a small hollow beneath some boulders, I dove inside, clamping my hands over my mouth to stifle my gasps. I could only pray the thing hadn't seen where I went. Frozen in terrified silence, I strained to hear any sound of pursuit over my thundering pulse. The forest had gone deathly quiet. Minutes crawled by with no sign of disturbance. Finally, I risked sliding out my pistol. The weight of it steadied me slightly, but I knew bullets would only slow this thing, not kill it. I had to make it to the ranger station. Hidden beneath a rocky overhang, I tried to control my ragged breathing as the sun slowly sank below the treetops. The forest noises that usually faded at dusk were replaced by other, more disturbing sounds. Echoing cries, guttural muttering just out of range. Whatever was out there hunting me was no ordinary animal. My hands shook as I checked my pistol's magazine for the dozenth time. Eight rounds left, useless against this thing if I didn't get a clean headshot, which seemed unlikely given the speed it moved. Spying between the branches, I searched desperately for some sign of my pursuer. There, a fleeting shift of movement. I squinted into the growing darkness. One shadow detached itself from the rest, loping through the underbrush. It paused, tilting its head as if sniffing the air. My blood turned to ice as it swiveled unnaturally to peer directly at my hiding spot with reflective, inhuman eyes. In the fading light I glimpsed a bald, skeletal figure crouched on all fours. I slapped a hand over my mouth to hold in a scream as I finally understood Chris's delirious ravings. This thing was real, and it had my scent. I huddled motionless as the creature slunk closer. My mind reeled with how such a being could exist. But I shoved aside those thoughts. I needed to survive the next five minutes, not unravel cosmic mysteries. The thing paused just yards away, head twitching side to side as it searched for me. I forced myself not to flinch as its black gaze swept over my thicket. 
With a gravelly hiss, it bounded away into the underbrush. I nearly sobbed in relief. The reprieve would be brief, though. I had to put as much distance between me and that thing as possible. While I still had light, I eased from my hiding spot and took off running. Twigs and stones cut into my feet, but I didn't slow down. Better injured than dead. Behind me echoed unmistakable sounds of pursuit. I pushed harder even as burning lungs begged for rest. When I came across a small creek, I jumped in without hesitation, hoping the water would confuse my scent trail. Static buzzed from my radio as I burst from the trees into a moonlit meadow, requesting immediate backup at... The only reply was garbled white noise. No one was coming to the rescue this time. Up ahead loomed a granite face I'd have to detour around. As I paused to get my bearings, a guttural cry rang out closer than expected. I fired two shots blindly toward it before stumbling on. Later I found myself collapsed on a stony outcrop, heaving for breath. The adrenaline fueling my headlong flight was spent. As the moon rose, the aches of my abused body screamed for acknowledgement. But rest wasn't an option. Somewhere behind me, the creature waited. I ran blindly through the darkness, throat raw from screaming into the void. The thing pursuing me moved swiftly, keeping to the shadows. Its unnatural mutters echoed around the trees, impossible to pinpoint. Exhaustion seeped into my bones, but I didn't dare stop. To pause even a moment was to surrender to the horrors lurking in this forest. Thorns tore at my skin as I crashed through the underbrush. I focused on the sting, using the pain to anchor myself against the panic threatening to overwhelm me. The dark forest seemed to press in from all sides as I staggered aimlessly through the night. My throat was raw and lungs burning from hours of screaming into the void for help. But no one was coming. The only reply was the mocking echo of my own panicked cries through the trees. And always... Just out of sight but drawing relentlessly nearer the unnatural mutters of the thing pursuing me. I lost all track of time and direction during that desperate, lonely flight. The monstrous creature herded me like prey, staying in the shadows but inexorably driving me forward through the trackless woods. Thorns and branches tore viciously at my skin and clothes, shredding my uniform shirt to tatters. My ripped and bloodied boots slipped on loose stones as I careened blindly on, barely keeping my footing. The iron taste of fear coated my tongue. I couldn't keep this up much longer. My exhausted limbs grew heavier with each frantic step, reflexes dulling dangerously. But to stop even for a moment meant surrendering to the unspeakable horror trailing me. So I forced leaden legs to keep churning, lungs to keep pumping, focused only on surviving the next minute and the one after that. Just before dawn, I stumbled out of a thicket and found myself in a rocky creek bed. My overwhelmed mind took long seconds to even comprehend it wasn't more endless forest. I stood swaying, ears ringing, and breath coming in ragged gasps. Gradually, the sound of flowing water registered. Salvation. I followed the beckoning murmur until my rubbery legs finally gave out on the smooth, damp stones lining the creek's bank. I collapsed in an ungainly heap, every muscle quivering with utter fatigue. The frigid creek water provided blessed relief against my hot, grimy skin as I lay there. With enormous effort, I rolled over and began splashing handfuls of it onto my face and arms, washing away some of the sweat and dirt caked on me. The chill of it helped pierce the fog shrouding my mind. As adrenaline from my panicked flight drained rapidly away, the true depth of my exhaustion became apparent. It was tempting to just lay my head down on the wet stones and give in to the desperate longing for rest, if only for a moment. My swollen eyelids begged to close against the grey pre-dawn light. But I couldn't sleep. Not yet. To let my guard down was to surrender myself completely to the horrors still lurking out in the darkness of that forest. There would be time for rest later, if I survived. With a pained groan, I pushed myself up to a sitting position. Though every fiber of my being screamed in protest, I forced myself to take stock of as morning approached. I needed to get oriented and move. My strength was nearly spent, but I couldn't lose hope. Shivering, I wrapped my arms around myself and stared down at the tattered remains of my uniformed shirt. It hung off me in filthy rags, leaving my scratched and bruised arms bare. 
My ripped hiking boots were stained with blood from countless nicks and scratches accumulated during that hellish night flight. I bent stiffly to check them, hissing as the cuts on my feet protested. Nothing serious, but they would slow me down. Fumbling at my belt with trembling damp hands, I unclipped my pistol and brought it unsteadily up to inspect. Just two rounds left in the magazine. Two slim bullets were all that stood between me and an unimaginably gruesome end. Fear twisted my gut, but I forced a fierce resolve to temper it. Making those shots count was my only chance. Taking a deep, bracing breath, I gazed up at the lightning sky visible through the tangled branches overhead. It was time to move. With monumental effort, I pushed up onto shaky legs, swaying as dizziness threatened to pull me back down. I stood gripping a tree, waiting for the sensation to pass, a prayer on my lips. Let me see the sun again. The diffuse gray light of pre-dawn revealed little of my surroundings. I stared blankly through the tangled branches, disoriented and lost after a night spent crashing blindly through these woods. Panic and exhaustion had shattered any sense of direction during that hellish flight. Now, as the promise of a new day slowly permeated the sky overhead, I realized I had become completely turned around in the darkness. These trees provided no familiar landmarks to guide me. I closed my eyes, swaying slightly as I tried to steady my ragged breathing. Think. I had to orient myself before moving another step. Kneeling carefully to avoid putting weight on my cut and blistered feet, I studied the forest floor, searching for signs to read the land. A ridge of sloping rocks led down to the creek beside me. Water flowed from higher elevations to lower ones. If I followed this creek downstream, it should lead to bigger rivers with trails. Craning my neck, I next inspected the trees themselves, while the south-facing bark remained bare. If the dawn light was coming from the east as expected, then the moss indicated the direction was north. I needed to go generally south and west. I rose slowly, ignoring the trembling in my exhausted limbs. The scant information gleaned from my surroundings would have to guide me for now. Without proper gear or daylight, there was no way to be completely sure. But I had no other choice but to trust my basic compass skills. I could only pray they didn't lead me in worse circles. Gripping my pistol in clammy hands, I chose my path and started walking. Each step was agony across my torn soles, but I gritted my teeth against the pain, moving as swiftly as injuries allowed. Better to suffer than to wait here like a lamb for slaughter, shuddering with hidden menace. I strained all my senses for signs of the creature's presence. Thus far, the morning remained hushed, but for the gurgle of the creek, and tentative morning bird song. It was comforting to hear that normal forest sounds again after the eerie silence of the night. Perhaps the return of daylight had driven the monster into hiding for now, but I harbored no illusion that I was free of it. No, it was simply biding its time, letting me expend precious energy stumbling towards imagined safety. It would trail just out of sight, toying with me, waiting for exhaustion to deliver me helplessly into its claws. The thought sent a chill colder than the creek water down my spine. I could not let my guard down for an instant. Every snapped twig and rustle of brush set my nerves thrumming like electrified wires. I walked lightly, stopping frequently to listen. Each time the forest held its breath. Eventually my own breathing and heartbeat roared deafeningly loud in the absence of other sounds. I clutched my gun, slick palm leaving condensation on the grip. The morning wore on as I hiked aimlessly through the tangled woods. With no trail to follow, I clambered over moss-slicked logs and pushed through grasping bushes, feeling utterly lost. As the adrenaline that had fueled my all-night flight sputtered out, despair crept over me. I was alone, and being hunted in this labyrinth of trees, with no idea how to escape. When I stumbled upon an old campsite, my heart leaped. Circled by stones was the unmistakable outline of where a tent had stood. Next to it, a trail wound away into the forest. Hope fluttered in my chest. Trails always led somewhere. I murmured a prayer as I stepped onto the narrow, overgrown path. Let it guide me to the ranger station. To safety, please. The surrounding trees seemed to crowd together, 
branches interlacing overhead to block out the morning sun, an unnatural silence gripped the forest as if it was holding its breath. The complete absence of birdsong or squirrels scrambling up trunks unnerved me. It was as if the entire woodland was waiting, a coiled spring ready to unleash violent chaos. I walked as swiftly as my battered feet could manage, hyper-aware of each rustle or crack. The trail gave focus to my movement, but also funneled me predictably forward. Easy prey for the predator that surely still stalked me, somewhere in the watching trees, searching for any sign of unnatural movement. By the time I glimpsed distant buildings through the foliage, I was stumbling badly. Tears of relief streamed down my grimy cheeks. I had made it. My ordeal was almost over. Mustering the very last of my strength, I broke into a limping run. Each impact sent shockwaves of pain up my legs, but I gritted my teeth and pushed onward. So close now. Closer and closer the buildings grew. I could make out the familiar shapes. There was the main office, the generator shed, my home for the past two summers. I was nearly there. With no warning, a piercing howl tore through the air just feet behind me. My head whipped around to see a pale, skinny, humanoid shape hurtling out from the trees, claws outstretched. I screamed and fired wildly over my shoulder as I dove off the trail. Hearing the shots crack harmlessly into trees, heart seizing in my chest, I stumbled and crashed hard to the forest floor. For one paralyzing moment, I lay winded. Then the heavy footfalls nearby jolted me upright. Ignoring my limbs' screaming protests, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for those sanctuary buildings, now almost close enough to touch, glimmering in the sunlight filtering through the trees. So close, so close. Please let me make it. I burst through the front door of the ranger station, the solid wood frame nearly coming off its hinges as I slammed it closed behind me. My heart was hammering violently in my chest as I frantically threw my full weight against the door, struggling to turn the lock with my trembling, bloody fingers. A split second later, a heavy thud collided with the door from outside, making the whole thing shudder on its hinges. I jumped back with a gasp, pulse roaring in my ears. The flimsy lock wouldn't hold it for long. Pure animal panic flooded my veins as I scanned the familiar surroundings of the ranger station's main room, desperately searching for anything I could use to further barricade the entrance. My eyes landed on the old wooden desk in the corner, weighed down by a bulky filing cabinet next to it. That would have to work. I rushed over and gripped the edges of the heavy furniture. With almost inhuman strength born of complete and utter terror, I ground my teeth and heaved them screeching in protest across the floor until they blocked the door. It wouldn't hold out the monster for long, but I just needed time, time to grab a weapon and call for help. Outside, furious blows began hammering relentlessly against the station's walls as the pale creature tried to break in and get to me. I could hear the boarded front window splintering inwards under the heavy assault. I ducked instinctively and raced for the back room that housed the emergency gun locker. My boots slipped in the blood trail I'd left across the floorboards. I struggled for traction, arms windmilling to stay upright. More bone-jarring impacts echoed through the small station's interior. The whole building seemed to shudder with the force of the battering it was enduring. I stumbled into the storage room, towards the grey metal locker along the back wall. The combination lock trembled in my slick, red-stained fingers. Blood pounded behind my eyes, roaring like the ocean surf. Through it, the sounds of shattering glass and splintering wood came from the other room. The creature was nearly through. I forced myself to breathe, to focus, as I carefully turned the combination dial, picturing the memorized numbers in my mind. On the third try, the locker clicked open. Inside lay a pump-action shotgun and rows of ammunition boxes. I grabbed the shotgun with one hand, while the other scooped up boxes of shells indiscriminately. A loud scraping came from behind the storage room's door. My head jerked up and I froze. It was inside, but only static greeted me. The surrounding mountains were still blocking any signal. The heavy slams against the exterior walls had ceased, leaving an eerie silence in their wake. The creature had stopped trying to get in, at least for the moment. Gripping the useless radio tighter, I slowly approached the barricaded front door. My light steps seemed to echo thunderously in the quiet. 
Pressing my ear tentatively against the wood, I listened hard past the frantic pounding of blood in my ears. No sound came from outside, except the nervous twittering of birds returning to the trees. No heavy footfalls, no panting or scrape of claws, just stillness. A flicker of desperate hope rose in my chest. Maybe, just maybe, I'd managed to elude the monster after all. Perhaps it had given up the hunt and retreated. But no, I couldn't let blind optimism lower my guard now, not with my own eyes confirming its death. Still, as the minutes ticked by in silence, I considered risking a look outside. I could leave the safety of the station to be rescued, or wait here for who knows how long until help arrived. It was a gamble either way. I wavered, chewing my stubbled nails anxiously. Live or die, the choice was mine. After several tense minutes spent pacing and weighing my options, I steeled my nerves. Gripping my gun with slick palms, I shuffled the heavy cabinet aside and cracked open the front door. The warm light of morning spilled in, calming my frayed senses. The familiar porch and sun-dappled trees looked so ordinary, so safe. I lifted my boot to step outside. A wet, squelching sound made me look down. My soul was soaked in a crimson puddle seeping from underneath the door. I swung the door wider. Dark blood streaked the weathered boards in erratic patterns, but no body lay there. Relief washed over me as the obvious conclusion surfaced. The creature must have been mortally wounded somehow. It couldn't have gotten far. I eased the rest of the way outside, stepping cautiously onto the blood-streaked boards of the porch. My eyes tracked the sporadic trail of dark drops leading off the steps and winding into the encroaching trees. Though every instinct screamed to stay barricaded inside, I knew I had to follow it. I needed to see the creature's broken corpse with my own eyes to know beyond any shred of doubt that the horror that had pursued me relentlessly through the night was well and truly dead. I stepped off the porch and crossed the short distance to the tree line. Passing into the shadows beneath the bowing canopy, I maneuvered carefully over gnarled roots and fallen branches, gun aimed and ready. Filtered morning light dappled the forest floor. Birds twittered cheerfully in the branches overhead. Yet tension still coiled tightly in my muscles, half expecting the beast to leap out from behind a broad trunk at any second. The sporadic trail of dark crimson droplets wove on through the underbrush ahead, each one vividly pronounced against the verdant green. I traced their erratic path slowly, pulse thundering in my ears despite the tranquil scene. The surrounding ferns and bushes showed no signs of disturbance, no broken stems or scattered leaves to indicate the creature's passing. Only those small, ominous splashes of red to guide me onward. The macabre trail ended, dots fading out twenty yards into the woods. I froze, eyes widening in dismay, breath catching sharply in my throat. No, 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 it wasn't possible. Not after everything I had suffered and survived to reach this supposed sanctuary. There, lying crumpled in a ravaged heap of mangled flesh and fur, was the massive body of a black bear. Remnants of its entrails strewn about, neck twisted back on itself from being snapped. My mind reeled in horror at what I was seeing. This carcass was fresh, killed just this morning. I had been deceived. A soft rustle sounded from somewhere overhead. My head jerked up towards the sound before I could stop myself. There, perched on a low, moss-shrouded branch, crouched the impossibly gaunt and pale form of the creature. Its wet gray flesh glistened in the sunlight. I stood paralyzed in the glare of those chilling obsidian eyes, unable to breathe, to think, to do anything but stare helplessly as the creature silently dropped to the forest floor in front of me, blocking any hope of escape. The creature stalked towards me, its movements unnaturally fluid and graceful, like a predator certain of its impending kill. My heel caught on a tree root as I scrambled backward. Arms flailing, I toppled over the savaged remains of the bear's carcass and crashed painfully onto the hard forest floor. The impact jarred my senses, scattering the cloying paralysis of fear that had seized my mind. Adrenaline surged through my veins, lending strength to my trembling muscles. I couldn't give up yet, and clawed my way back to my feet. I had beaten impossible odds to survive this far. 
I would not die whimpering like a lamb at slaughter. The creature paused its measured approach, tilting its hairless head with interest as I backed away. Its void black eyes tracked my movement hungrily beneath a pale elongated skull. The faint morning light gleamed wetly off its muscles beneath leathery skin as it moved. I couldn't outrun this thing on my weakened legs. I needed a weapon if I had any hope of escaping its clutches. Spying a fallen branch within reach, I darted for it as the creature tensed to pounce. My hands closed around solid wood just as it sprung. I swung with all my remaining might, adrenaline lending strength to my exhausted limbs. The branch cracked with a resounding thwack across the monster's skull. Howling, it recoiled sideways, clawed hands grasping its face as inky blood streamed from the scalp wound down its face. I had dazed it, but not for long. This was my only chance. I lunged desperately for my fallen pistol, fingers scrabbling in the leaf litter until they finally closed around the grip. Whirling back towards the creature, I fired off two successive rounds point-blank into its chest. The gunshots boomed deafeningly between the... The creature's shriek of pain and fury pierced my eardrums like jagged metal, yet it remained upright, limbs coiling. My eyes widened. The small rounds had impacted pale flesh, but passed clean through rather than stopping it. Still, dark blood now seeped from multiple wounds. I had injured it, if not killed. Perhaps just enough to slow it a precious few seconds so I can escape. I pushed myself up and ran. My weakened legs screaming in protest as I wove drunkenly between the trees. Each impact sent shockwaves of bone-deep pain jolting through my battered body but I forced leaden feet to keep churning, lungs gasping raggedly for air. The creature's enraged cries echoed behind as it gave pursuit, driving me onward faster through sheer desperation. Safety was so close now, just ahead past the tree line. I could make it if I just kept moving. The shape of the ranger station emerged from between the trees less than 50 yards ahead. It was so close now. Yet those last few dozen yards may as well have been miles with the creature in pursuit just behind me. Still, I now had a chance. I repeated the desperate mantra again and again in my mind, willing leaden legs to keep churning. Just a little farther. Don't stop. You can do this. The station grew tantalizingly nearer with each stride, but so too did the frenzied wails of the wounded creature doppering after me. It was slowed by injuries, but not dead, not nearly enough to halt its relentless hunt. Twenty yards now, ten. My lungs burned like fire in my heaving chest. Still, I pushed harder. With a final explosive burst, I ran up the creaking steps of the porch and slammed bodily into the solid wooden door. Searing pain exploded through my shoulder from the impact, but I barely registered it as I grasped desperately for the handle. The guttural roars were nearly upon me as I wrenched the door inward and dove across the threshold. Somehow, I found the coordination to turn even as I fell and slammed my palm against the bolt lock, throwing it home. Seconds later, the entire door shuddered violently under a heavy collision as the enraged creature flung itself against the barrier now separating us. The walls reverberated from the force of the blows as it shrieked and clawed wildly on the other side, but this time the sturdy frame held firm. Dropping my forehead against the floorboards in dizzying relief, I gasped for air between ragged sobs. The frenzied pounding soon faded away into the forest as the creature retreated. For now, at least, I was safe. I had survived against all odds. As my breathing slowed and adrenaline seeped from my veins, the full weight of utter exhaustion pressed down, luring me toward unconsciousness. But I couldn't rest yet. Gripping the door handle weakly, I used it to pull my battered body upright. Swaying, I leaned there, gathering my strength as the familiar confines of the station swam around me. Sitting here now, it's surreal to think it's been almost twenty years since that terrifying experience in the forest. In some ways, it feels like yesterday, the images and sensations are still so viscerally burned into my mind. I still occasionally jerk awake at night from nightmares of glowing eyes and pale flesh flashing between the dark trees. But during my waking hours, the memories have dulled and faded somewhat, become almost detached, 
like something that happened to another person. It's the only way my psyche can process such trauma. By compartmentalizing it into its own small box in my mind, closed off and separated from my present reality. After the creature finally retreated back into the depths of the forest, I managed to barricade myself inside the small ranger station. Adrenaline spent, I sank to the floor and slipped into unconsciousness. I awoke hours later to the distant thrum of helicopter blades and glimpsed flashing lights through the window. Apparently, my missed mandatory check-ins over the radio had triggered the emergency response protocols when I didn't confirm I was okay. I was airlifted out of those remote woods to a hospital in the nearest town. I spent about a week there, recovering physically from hypothermia, dehydration, and my various wounds while also meeting with counselors to recover emotionally from my trauma. But I'm beyond grateful I pulled through intact. The medical staff were confounded by my mutterings about what had actually happened out there. In the end, lacking any evidence, officials chalked it up to delirium from a wild animal attack and severe disorientation. I eventually stopped trying to convince them it was more. These days I avoid going anywhere near the wilderness, sticking to safe, populated city parks for my outdoor time. The isolation and unchecked danger of the deep woods unnerves me to my core. I doubt I'll ever be able to wander remote forested areas freely alone again. But the memories, as faded as they've become, remind me that I made it through my own personal hell once already. Though I still believe in the existence of the creature, its reality forever remains unproven to anyone else. Skeptical ears. No one else alive knows what I faced out there as I fled from my life under the branches of those looming pines. And so, to the wider world, it remains simply the delusion of a trauma-stricken mind. But I know the truth. I felt its rancid breath on my neck and stared into eyes that reflect only primal hunger. Something unnatural lurks beneath the gentle mask of the forest, and I know without doubt that it's still roaming and hunting. No one else may believe such delusions, but I know what haunts the dark shadows between the trees. I was one of the lucky ones. Others may not escape its grasp as I did. It's been over 20 years now since that fateful camping trip in the summer of 1996, but there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about what happened to us out there in the Blackwood Forest of Northern California. Even after two decades, the nightmares still wake me in a cold sweat nearly every night. I can still hear the screams of my friends and still see their pale, lifeless bodies when I close my eyes. Though I was just a teenager at the time, the events of that trip have defined the rest of my life. We were just a bunch of carefree high school kids looking for an adventure that summer, too young and naive to understand the dangers that lurked within that remote forest. Blackwood had a dark reputation locally, with many stories and legends surrounding the thousands of wooded acres. Folks in the nearby town of Redfield warned that those woods were haunted, whispering rumors of mysterious creatures and unexplained disappearances. Dating back centuries, we just laughed off the ghost stories, thinking the townspeople were just paranoid hicks. We never could have imagined how terrifyingly real the evil in those woods actually was. My friends and I had been planning this camping trip for months. Finally, after weeks of eager anticipation, the big weekend arrived. We loaded up all of our gear into two SUVs and hit the road, ready for a fun weekend of camping deep in the remote backcountry woods. There were six of us total on the trip, me, my best friend Mark, our friends Jen and Ben, and a couple we were all friends with, Callie and Ryan. We cranked up the music as we drove, singing along and getting pumped up for our adventure. The long drive went by quickly since we were laughing and joking the whole time. We turned off the main highway onto increasingly narrow and winding dirt roads. The further we got from civilization, the more excited we became. When at last we pulled into the gravel parking area at the trailhead, we whooped and cheered, eager to get out into nature. After the long drive, we finally arrived at the trailhead parking lot. I did a little celebratory dance as I hopped out of the car, beyond excited to get out on the trail. We opened up the backs of our SUVs and started unloading all of our camping gear. 
I slung my big hiking backpack on and tightened the straps on my shoulders. The weight of a fully loaded pack felt good and comforting, like I was ready for an epic adventure. My friends were all suiting up in their hiking clothes and boots too. All right, gang, let's divvy this stuff up evenly so we all carry a fair share, said Ben, always the logical one. We made piles of the communal gear and divided it up. Tents, cooking supplies, food for dinner and breakfast, first aid kit, water filter, ropes, rain fly, and other miscellaneous items. I packed my portion into my backpack, making sure to distribute the weight evenly. Everyone got their rain jackets handy in case we get an afternoon thunderstorm? Mark asked. We all responded affirmatively. Mark was like the protective big brother of our group, always looking out for us. I smiled, looking around at my friends, appreciating that we all brought different strengths to our squad. Finally, with fully loaded backpacks on, hiking poles in hand, and a trail map secured, we were ready. We did a final check to make sure our packs were cinched down tight and hit the trail. Mark set a brisk pace in the lead. I fell into step right behind him. The others chatted excitedly as we hiked deeper into the woods. Lush green forests surrounded us on all sides. It was a mostly uphill hike, but the grade was moderate. With our adrenaline pumping, we were making great time. About 45 minutes in, Mark called for a short water break. We dropped packs and gulped down some water. How's everyone feeling so far? He asked. I'm loving this, said Jen. My pack feels good. This was so worth the long drive out here. We all murmured in agreement and then continued onward and upward. As we gained elevation, the forest around us got increasingly dense and primeval looking. Huge pine trees towered over us and a lush carpet of ferns and mosses covered the shaded forest floor. After a solid two hours of hiking, I was starting to feel it in my legs and hips. He chuckled and checked his map and GPS device. Just under two more miles, I'd say, he replied. This is perfect. We're right on pace. Reinvigorated, we pushed on, the promise of setting down our heavy packs driving us forward. Half an hour later, we stumbled across a gorgeous babbling stream cutting through the woods. The cool mountain water looked incredibly inviting. Mark checked our position again. This is it, he announced triumphantly. Just ahead we could see a clearing between the trees. We pushed through into the open space, taking in the idyllic spot that would be our camp for the next few days. It was a nice flat clearing, maybe half an acre, surrounded by towering pines that provided shade. The creek we had just passed ran along one side. This is perfect, exclaimed Jen, dropping her pack to the ground with a thud, said Ryan. This spot is awesome, totally worth the hike in. We all voiced our agreement and excitement as we gratefully slid our sore shoulders out of our pack straps. I rolled my neck and shoulders, feeling the satisfying release after bearing that weight for miles. All right, folks, let's get camp set up before sunset, Mark instructed. Mark and I had done enough backpacking trips together that putting up our shared tent was a smooth, practiced process. Working in sync, we got it pitched and staked down in a nice flat spot. Meanwhile, Jen and Callie were teaming up to get their tent up. The two couples each set up their own solo tents. In no time, our cozy little tent village was fully assembled. We stood back and admired our handiwork. Three handsome tents circled around a cleared out area for the campfire. This backcountry campsite already felt so welcoming. Mark built up a basic fire ring with logs and stones, while the rest of us got our sleeping pads and bags unpacked and laid out neatly in our tents. By the time we finished setting up camp, the orange light of sunset was filtering through the trees. I took a deep breath of the crisp mountain air. This is exactly what I needed, I contentedly told Mark. Just wait until that campfire is crackling tonight, he replied with a smile. By then, my stomach was growling loudly. Who's ready for some grub? Mark asked. A chorus of me came from the group. We broke out our camping chairs and coolers and had an epic feast of hot dogs, chips, and cold beer by the creek as the sun set. Nothing like food that always tastes better in the great outdoors, with full bellies. We all sat contentedly watching the sparks float up from our campfire. As the daylight faded to inky darkness, we laughed and told stories and jokes around the crackling firelight. 
I gazed up in wonder at the dazzling canopy of stars above us. I was really savoring this moment, being disconnected from it all, and having quality time with my closest friends. A couple of hours later, Mark stood up to go into the woods to pee. Ryan teased and watch out for bears. We all chuckled as Mark waved dismissively and wandered off into the blackness. Fifteen minutes went by and Mark still hadn't returned. Jen called out loudly, You okay out there, Mark? Did you get eaten by a mountain lion? We all snickered, but I did start to feel a sense of unease. It shouldn't take this long just to pee. After a few more minutes, Jen yelled Mark's name again, but got no reply. Now I was really starting to get worried. Jen and I made eye contact, both clearly thinking the same thing. We stood up and grabbed our flashlights. We're gonna go look for him real quick, I told the others. They nodded, looking concerned. Jen and I headed into the woods in the direction Mark had gone earlier. We called his name over and over, urgently sweeping our flashlights around. The search felt eerie, like something from a horror movie. The dark, dense woods swallowed up our flashlight beams just a few yards in. Mark! I shouted desperately. My heart thudded. Where was he? After twenty more minutes of fruitless searching, Jen and I made the decision to turn back. Neither of us wanted to say it out loud, but we were scared. Something seemed very wrong here. We hurried over to our friends at the campfire. Callie jumped up. Did you find him? Jen and I just shook our heads grimly. We quickly explained that Mark was still missing. The carefree mood from earlier had vanished. I'll go out looking next, Ben volunteered. One by one, we each grabbed a flashlight and went out into those dark woods, calling Mark's name over and over again. Every time someone returned alone, the dread mounted. After two hours of repeated searches in every direction, we reconvened by the campfire, exhausted and terrified. Mark was gone without a trace. Were we in danger too? What lurked out there just beyond our small ring of light, just out of sight? We debated whether we should pack up and get out of there immediately, but ultimately decided we couldn't just abandon our friend. Even though our minds jumped to scary possibilities of why he would have disappeared. In the end, we decided to spend the night here and start searching again at sunrise. None of us got much sleep, tossing and turning our imaginations in overdrive. At one point, I thought I heard a distant cry from somewhere in those dark woods. I sat bolt upright in my sleeping bag, breath frozen, straining my ears. Had I imagined it? Jen's fearful eyes told me she'd heard it too, from her own tent. None of us spoke of it, but I think we all internally reached the same conclusion. Something sinister was going on here in this remote forest. Mark wasn't just lost or injured, he had been taken. By who or what, we had no idea, but we weren't leaving until we found Mark, or what remained of him. As the first faint light of dawn peeked through the trees, we packed up our gear, determined to get to the bottom of this. As a group, we ventured back into the woods, calling Mark's name, jumping at every snap twig or rustle. Where are you, Mark? What happened to you out here? The endless trees offered no answers. After Mark's disappearance, we all slowly migrated back to the campfire. The dancing flames were now just smoldering embers, casting an ominous reddish glow onto our anxious faces. I stared into the dying fire, playing back the disturbing events of this evening over and over in my mind. Mark wandered off alone into the dark woods, the endless, hopeless searching, his chilling disappearance without a trace. I looked up from the fire to take in the fearful expressions of my friends gathered around me. Jen had pulled her knees to her chest and was rocking back and forth gently. Her usual bubbly warmth had been replaced by a tense, haunted look. Ben just gazed blankly ahead, absently poking at the fire with a long stick. Callie's face was stained with tears as she squeezed Ryan's hand tightly. She looked completely distraught. The silence around the fire was deafening. I could tell we were all churning over the same terrifying thoughts about what might have happened to Mark, and what could be lurking out there just beyond the fragile ring of firelight. Jen was the first to break the heavy silence. We... we need to get out of here. Now! Her voice wavered as she made the emphatic plea to the group. Callie's head snapped up, her eyes flashing with anger and defiance. No, we can't just abandon Mark like that, 
she exclaimed fiercely. Ryan put a comforting hand on her shoulder, but she shook it off. Babe, Jen's right, Ryan said softly. We've looked everywhere for Mark. It's not safe for us to stay here. I could hear the regret in his voice. Ryan was the most logical among us, as much as it pained him. I could tell he believed now that there was no hope left of finding Mark alive. So we just leave without him? Callie cried, fresh tears spilling down her cheeks. Ben finally spoke up, his voice flat and resigned. Mark is probably... He trailed off and took a shaky breath before continuing. Look, I hate to say this, but I think we have to accept he might be dead. His blunt words hit me like a punch in the gut. Hearing the devastating possibility spoken aloud somehow made it more real and confirmed my deepest fears. Beside me, Jen let out a muffled sob into her hands. The heavy silence returned, broken only by Callie's anguished weeping. I noticed Ben's eyes glistening with tears in the firelight. Mark was one of his closest friends. We were all reeling. But we couldn't afford to fall apart right now, not if we wanted to survive. Okay, okay, let's all just take a breath and figure this out, I said, trying to infuse my voice with a calming strength. I think we can all agree that something sinister seems to be going on here. They all gave solemn nods. As much as it kills me, I don't think staying here is safe for us. I continued gently, but we also can't just disappear like Mark did. We owe it to him to come back with help. This launched a more anxious debate about whether to escape the woods now or stay at camp till sunrise. Callie remained adamant about not leaving Mark behind. As the arguing went in circles, I felt myself wavering, completely torn about what choice was right. But one thing was clear. We needed to decide our next move soon before whatever took Mark came for one of us next. Maybe we could just pack up our stuff and drive to the nearest town for help, Jen suggested hopefully. But the nearest town was over an hour away on those twisting dirt back roads. Her pleading eyes darted around to each of us, seeking support. But I wasn't sure that idea would even work. Who would we even find for help in some sleepy rural town in the middle of the night? From across the fire pit, Ryan suddenly sat up straight, his gaze sharpening. No, we're staying. We all turned to look at him as he continued. We can't let some strange noises scare us off and ruin this trip. We came out here to have a fun weekend of camping with our friends. Well, I say we stick it out until sunrise, at least before making any rash decisions. Rash decisions, she exclaimed, her fear taking on a hard edge. Mark is gone, Ryan, taken by God knows what, and you want us to just casually hang out until morning? Ryan held up his hands in a calming gesture. Look, I know you're freaked out. We all are. But it seems like whatever took Mark only targets people who wander off alone. As long as we stay together at camp, we should be safe till daylight. Despite his reassuring words, I felt a knot of dread in my stomach. Mark had just gone to the bathroom by himself only a hundred yards away from camp. Were we really safe staying here with whatever was in these woods? Jen voiced the same concern, her eyes brimming with tears. Mark was taken so close to camp, she said anxiously. What if that thing comes back for one of us next? I'll stay awake all night and keep the fire blazing. You all try and get some rest. His sculpted jaw was set stubbornly. I looked around at Ben and Callie. Ben just gave a grim nod while Callie clung tightly to Ryan's arm, seemingly persuaded by her boyfriend's words. As for me, every bone in my body shrieked at me that we needed to get out of these woods immediately. But Ryan and Callie seemed dead set on not running. Uneasily, I exchanged glances with Jen and Ben. We were outvoted here. As much as our instincts screamed at us to flee, we reluctantly agreed to stay until sunrise. The once roaring campfire had gradually dwindled down to sputtering flames and glowing embers. Our pile of firewood was nearly gone, after desperately keeping the fire stoked all evening, hoping its light would keep us safe, sending sparks drifting up into the inky night sky. We need more wood, he said. Ben and I will go grab some. Ben nodded silently and stood up. I noticed him slide a large hunting knife into his belt before grabbing one of the flashlights. Ryan grabbed the other flashlight, and the two men headed off into the woods together. 
The rest of us remaining at camp watched their flashlight beams bobble away into the trees until they faded from view, leaving us in dim firelight. I shivered, suddenly feeling very exposed and vulnerable without Ryan and Ben here. Jen sidled over next to me and squeezed my hand tightly for reassurance. On my other side, Callie was wrapped in a blanket, staring vacantly ahead. We were all exhausted from the emotional turmoil of this night, but too terrified to sleep. To calm my nerves while we waited, I tried making idle chatter. The stars sure are beautiful tonight, I commented, gazing up at the glittering expanse above us. Jen nodded, but her reply was clipped. Yeah, I guess. I internally kicked myself for making such inane small talk given our current crisis. An anxious hush settled back over camp. Every little forest noise made us jump. After about twenty minutes, Jen broke the silence again. They should have been back by now, right? Her voice wavered with fear. I shook my head, not wanting to consider the implications. Give them a little more time, I replied trying to sound reassuring despite my own growing dread. But when nearly an hour had passed with no sign of Ryan and Ben returning, we could no longer ignore the terrifying truth. They must be gone, just like Mark before them. Jen whimpered, fighting back tears. Oh God, we have to go look for them. I took a deep breath, readying myself. She was right. Grabbing our flashlights and knives in shaky grips, the three of us headed into the woods. Jen called Ben's name while I shouted desperately for Ryan, but only silence answered. My heart pounded as the three of us ventured into the dark woods, gripping our flashlights tightly. We had to find Ryan and Ben. The beams cut through the darkness as we called their names over and over. Jen walked just ahead of me. I could see her shoulders trembling. As terrified as I felt, I knew I needed to try to be strong for her and Callie. Ryan, I yelled at the top of my lungs. Ben, can you hear us? Their names echoed through the trees with no reply. The woods were eerily still, like a graveyard. The only sounds were our own faltering footsteps and the rushing of blood in my ears. We walked and called until we arrived at the area where Ryan and Ben had gone to collect firewood. Jen's flashlight suddenly froze. Oh God, she gasped. I hurried over to where she aimed the beam at the base of a large oak tree. There lay Ryan and Ben's flashlights, casting a faint glow on the dark forest floor, but there was no sign of Ryan or Ben themselves. Gone, just like Mark before them. Callie let out an anguished, gurgling cry and sank to her knees beside me. I stood paralyzed, a sob catching in my throat as the dire reality sank in. We were being picked off one by one by some unseen evil lurking in these woods. I helped Callie up and pulled Jen into a hug as she broke down, weeping. As much as I wanted to collapse in grief, I knew I had to get us out of here. Come on, we need to go, I urged, putting my arms around them and guiding us away from this awful spot. They stumbled along with me, leaning into my sides for support and comfort. We finally emerged from the woods back into our camp's clearing. Why? Why, Ryan? She cried up at the sky. Seeing her raw anguish shook me from my own stupor. We had to move fast. I gave Callie a bracing shake. Callie, look at me. We're getting out of here, okay? Come on, help us pack up. Without speaking, we set off down the dirt road on foot, ready for the long trek ahead. I tried to project an air of confidence, but my pounding heart betrayed my anxiety. Were we walking right back into danger? We hiked in tense silence for a while, senses on high alert. Every little sound from the dark woods made us jump. The reality of our situation, three young women alone out here fleeing some unknown evil, hit me hard. But what choice did we have? Stopping wasn't an option. After hiking for over an hour, Jen suddenly stopped short. Do you guys really think we can make it all the way back on foot? Kaylee's head swiveled around nervously. Yeah. What if we just end up lost wandering around in the dark? Maybe we should have just stayed put. I hesitated, realizing they had a point. Blindly stumbling through unfamiliar woods at night was pretty risky, but the thought of just waiting there, helpless and terrified until daylight was somehow worse. Let's just keep going a little further, I urged them. I know we can follow it back, but in truth, I was starting to have doubts. Were we even still going in the right direction? 
Everything looked the same in the dark. We continued on, but soon the fatigue from stress and lack of sleep started to hit us hard. Our pace slowed to a weary trudge. After another half hour with no sign of the road, we stopped again, completely spent, putting her head in her hands. Oh God, we're totally lost, she groaned. I sank down beside her. My feet throbbed painfully inside my boots. Nothing about our surroundings looked familiar. Jen was right. We were well and truly lost, but I wasn't ready to fully give up hope yet. Let's just rest for a minute to clear our heads, then we can figure out a plan, I suggested, trying to keep my voice upbeat. Callie stood hugging herself, looking around fretfully. I don't like just sitting here. We're completely exposed out in the open like this. I knew she was right. Staying put in one place was risky, but stumbling blindly around lost in the dark also wasn't any safer. We were in a real bind here. As we debated our limited options, the temperature seemed to drop abruptly. An ominous prickle ran down my spine. That feeling of being watched returned. Something wicked this way comes. Jen seemed to sense it too. She stood up uneasily. You know what? Maybe we should head back to the campsite after all. I think we overestimated how difficult it would be to hike in the dark. I rose on aching legs, with no better options. We reluctantly decided to return the way we came. The walk back seemed to take much longer, weighed down by disappointment. The night pressed in oppressively around us. Shadows seemed to flit at the corner of my vision. Everything about this forest felt hostile and predatory. Finally, with dawn still impossibly far off, the faint firelight of our camp came into view. We staggered gratefully back into the clearing, too tired to even feel defeat. We rebuilt the fire as best we could and huddled close. The remaining hours until dawn passed agonizingly slowly as the three of us took turns standing guard while the others tried futilely to rest. Every little snap of a twig or rustle in the brush made us jump, our exhausted minds imagining unseen threats lurking just out of sight. When it was my turn to watch, I paced around the dim campfire, straining my eyes into the surrounding darkness and gripping a thick tree branch tightly in my sweaty palms. I doubted any of us got more than a few fitful minutes of sleep that night. Jen emerged from her tent, blanket wrapped around her shoulders, dark circles under her eyes. How are you holding up? I asked gently. How do you think? She replied tersely. I nodded in understanding. We were all fraying at the edges. Jen fixed me with an urgent look. We need to make a run for the cars while it's still dark. It's our only hope. I hesitated. As much as I wanted to flee this nightmare, I knew Callie would refuse to leave the others behind. As if on cue, Callie crawled out of her tent upon overhearing us, her face hardening. Absolutely not, she stated adamantly. We stick together no matter what. Jen threw her hands up in exasperation. Stick together and wait to be picked off one by one like the others. No way I'm getting out of here. She started gathering her things to leave. Kaylee stormed over and grabbed Jen's arm roughly. You're not going anywhere! Jen wrenched her arm away, getting right in Kaylee's face. Don't tell me what to do. I'm trying to save myself since no one else seems to care. The two continued screaming at each other. I jumped between them, holding them apart before things got physical. Knock it off, both of you! I shouted. They backed away, still seething but seeing reason again. I felt sick at how quickly our group had unraveled. We were all on edge, pushed to the brink mentally. Later, during Callie's watch, I was yanked from my sleep by her blood-curdling screams. Stumbling from my tent, the night's stillness was shattered by distant howls and heavy footsteps crunching leaves, growing steadily louder. The noise seemed to surround us on all sides, impossibly close to our camp. Callie sobbed, frozen in terror. Adrenaline flooded my veins as we cried out in blind panic. I desperately worked to spark the dying embers back to life while Jen and Callie screamed and grabbed burning branches to use as weapons. Peering out into the darkness past the feeble ring of firelight, we could just make out a large, shadowy figure slowly circling the camp's perimeter. It moved with an unnatural, hulking gait, weaving between the trees and staying maddeningly out of full view. My heart seized with primal, visceral terror at the sight of this unknown entity stalking us. Some ancient, savage part of my brain recognized the unmistakable threat closing in, 
even if my conscious mind couldn't comprehend or accept what we were witnessing. Beside me, Jen let out a strangled whimper, gripping my arm with bone-white knuckles. She choked out under her breath. We have to run now! Before I could reply, Callie turned on Jen, eyes blazing. Are you crazy? We are not leaving our friends behind, Callie yelled. Jen faced her down fiercely. You really think Mark or the others are still alive out there? That thing is hunting us. We need to get out of here while we still can. I hesitated, watching the large shadow continue its walk just outside the trees. We were torn, terrified to run deeper into the woods, but also unable to just sit here waiting to be slaughtered. Still, the thought of abandoning any hope of finding the others filled me with shame. We should at least wait until dawn, I offered weakly, trying to reconcile both sides. Jen spit back at me. She turned abruptly, and before we could stop her, bolted straight into the dark woods alone. Forgetting the monster, Callie and I screamed Jen's name in unison and immediately gave chase without thinking. I ran through the forest after Jen's receding flashlight beam, Callie close behind me. What followed was a race through the pitch-black forest. Unable to even see the ground beneath our feet, we called Jen's name over and over. Desperate cries that went unanswered, except for the furious ringing in my ears as trees and branches clawed at us from all sides. Then Jen's flashlight beam suddenly swung wildly as we heard her cry out just ahead. Rounding a massive tree trunk, her screams abruptly cut off, leaving only silence. Nothing but undisturbed forest floor ahead. No sign of Jen. In the span of seconds, she had been swallowed up by the darkness. Gone, just like all the others. Now it was just Callie and I left alone in these cursed woods. We clung to each other desperately, sobbing and shaking. Jen's scream still echoed in my mind, playing on a loop. I don't know how long we stood paralyzed in that spot. Time lost all meaning. But gradually, as the initial shock wore off, a creeping sense of madness took hold in me. I became irrationally convinced that whatever malevolent force had taken the others must have now gotten to Callie, too. I pulled away from her abruptly and fixed her with a deranged, suspicious glare. Callie stared back at me, confused and hurt. Why are you looking at me like that? She asked worriedly. It's just us now. We have to stick together. But paranoid delusions continued flooding my exhausted, overstimulated mind. This couldn't be Callie. The evil must have taken her too. Left this thing in her place to get to me. I backed away slowly. You're not Callie. Not anymore, I said accusingly. Callie's eyes went wide with alarm. What are you talking about? Of course I'm me. She stepped towards me pleadingly but I was seeing enemies everywhere now, my frayed mind snapping. Stay back, I shouted, grabbing a branch off the ground and wielding it threateningly. Whoa, take it easy, Callie said, raising her hand slowly. You're not thinking straight right now. Just breathe. But her soothing words only reinforced my delusion, that this was some impersonator trying to lure me into complacency. Before she could come any closer, I lashed out, tackling her roughly to the ground. Callie fought back fiercely as I grappled to restrain her. It's me, you idiot! Stop! She screamed hoarsely, but her protests fell on deaf ears. I was too far gone, operating on primal instinct now. We rolled around violently on the forest floor. Leaves and dirt flying as we struggled. Kaylee landed a hard knee to my stomach, momentarily knocking the wind out of me. Still, my crazed adrenaline kept me going. I landed a glancing blow to her jaw, making her cry out. Eventually, after what felt like hours of scuffling, we collapsed next to each other, spent and bleeding. As the manic surge of energy seeped from my body, my frenzied suspicions began to loosen their grip on my reality. I rolled over painfully to see Callie lying a few feet away, eyes swollen and limbs trembling. Sudden recognition flooded through me. Oh God, Callie, it's really you! I stammered, horrified with myself. I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. She glared back warily. It's about time you came to your senses, she croaked. I crawled over to help her up. She flinched but allowed me to examine her injuries. No broken bones at least. I sighed with relief. Leaning on each other heavily, we limped back to our camp. Barely speaking, 
Callie and I took turns sitting up and gripping the hunting knife tightly as the endless night crawled on at a torturous pace. Neither of us got even a moment of true rest. Whenever it was my turn to stand watch, I perched uneasily on a log by the dead fire, knife poised and eyes scanning the encroaching woods for any sign of movement. Callie wasn't much better off during her turns trying to sleep. I could hear her tossing and turning inside the tent, frequently crying out from vivid nightmares. As the hour before dawn finally approached, the noises surrounding our camp increased to a maddening level. Branches creaked, leaves rustled, and strange distant howls pierced the night air, setting my nerves on edge. It seemed like whatever sinister presence lurked out there was intentionally toying with us, making us suffer psychologically before moving in for the kill. The sporadic noises formed an ominous soundtrack to our torment, keeping us suspended in a state of constant dread. At some point I realized with horror that the fire had died completely, leaving us in pitch darkness. But my hands had gone numb and useless from fear. Soon we were enveloped in an oppressive blanket of blackness, like a physical manifestation of the evil that had decimated our group. When I heard Callie beginning to stir in her tent again, I called out to her timidly. Callie, are you awake? The fire went out. She crawled out of the tent slowly, blanket wrapped around her shoulders. Even in the darkness, I could see the hollow, haunted look in her eyes. This night had shattered us both. What are we going to do? She rasped, voice rough from screaming. I just shook my head helplessly at a total loss. We stayed like that as the night sound swelled, taking turns trying to light the dead fire as that unseen predator seemed to draw nearer. Finally, I grabbed the knife from Callie firmly. You try the fire, I said with new resolve. I'll stand guard. She nodded numbly and continued rubbing the flint together. I widened my stance holding the knife in front of me with trembling hands. My heart pounded as the noises grew louder and closer, crackling branches, heavy footsteps, guttural grunts coming for us. In a brief moment of panic, I suddenly felt Callie grabbing desperately for the knife. Let me have it, she cried. We struggled briefly, arms flailing blindly. Then I felt the knife sink into soft flesh. Callie screamed in agony, a sound that pierced my heart. My flashlight revealed the horror. The knife lodged in Callie's right forearm, blood flowing steadily over her fingers as she clutched the wound. No, no, no! I stammered, rushing to help, but she shoved me away forcefully with her good arm. She staggered away from me into the dark trees, leaving a trail of black blood glistening on the leaves. Now I was alone, with no one left but me to make some kind of final stand against the evil that had systematically destroyed us all. But as the noises drew closer still, I sank to my knees in abject defeat and despair, the knife falling uselessly from my hand. I frantically tried striking the flint again to restart the dead fire, but my hands were numb and useless with fear. The utter darkness surrounding me seemed alive and hungry. After multiple failed attempts to spark a flame, I finally resigned myself to my fate. There would be no fire or light to ward off whatever horrors lurked right outside the feeble ring of camp. Unsure what else to do in these final hours, I sat down on the cold dirt and shakily took my phone from my pocket. I knew I might not make it out of these woods alive once daylight came. The least I could do was record a goodbye message for my family, some kind of explanation in case they never found my body. With tears running down my face, I began recording a rambling video. Hey mom, dad, it's me. I'm so sorry about everything. I never should have come out here. This was a mistake. I recounted the horrific events of the night. I'm pausing frequently to wipe my eyes and collect myself. I told them how much I loved them and how I wished I had appreciated our time together more instead of taking it for granted. Finally, I said everything I could think of and ended the recording. I wondered grimly if anyone would ever see it, or if it would just be lost forever in these cursed woods with me. At least I had tried to make amends in some small way, though it offered little comfort. Shakily, I slipped my phone back into my pocket and looked upward. The blackness of night was just barely beginning to dilute with the first hints of dawn approaching. 
as I sat there contemplating my dwindling options, I decided I couldn't just passively await death once daylight finally broke. If I was going down, I would at least go down fighting with my last ounce of strength. I recalled suddenly the gravel parking area where we had first left our cars, what felt like a lifetime ago. If I could somehow make it back there, I might have a chance of escaping this nightmare. It was a slim hope, but my only remaining one. The instant the pale light of sunrise began shining through the trees, I sprang into action. Bursting forth from the woods, I ran full tilt in the direction I desperately hoped the parking lot was. My legs burned and my lungs screamed for air, but I pushed through the pain, running faster than I ever had in my life. Up ahead, the blessed sight of the gravel lot emerged from the trees. The cars were still there, untouched. They almost seemed to beckon me towards salvation. I summoned my last shreds of energy and sprinted ahead recklessly. Safety was so agonizingly close now, but just yards from freedom. I was blindsided and tackled brutally to the ground by an immense crushing weight. The impact forced all the air from my lungs and drove my face into the dirt. I gasped and clawed weakly at the ground, but whatever had me was far stronger. This was it. Paralyzed with terror, I could only lie pinned helplessly beneath the monster. I felt its fetid breath hot on the back of my neck. The sensation of sharp teeth grazing my skin made me shudder involuntarily. I closed my eyes and braced for the end, praying it would be quick. The creature's excited snarls filled my ears as it seemed to savor my terror and pain toying with me. This is it, I thought. This is how I die. The creature's immense clawed hands closed around my ankles in a vice-like grip. Before I could react, it hauled me effortlessly off the ground and began dragging me away, my body bouncing and jostling painfully over rocks and roots. I kicked and flailed violently, screaming until my voice went hoarse, but I may as well have been fighting against a cinderblock wall for all the good it did. This monster barely seemed to register my blows as it lugged me like a ragdoll deeper into the shadowy woods. In desperation, I twisted around, clawing at the soil and digging my fingers into the underbrush. I left deep gouges rip through the forest floor in my wake, but the dense tangled roots only slowed our progress slightly, never giving enough for me to get free. The creature remained focused on its goal, oblivious to my struggles. It dragged me onward relentlessly the morning sunlight fading as we went deeper into the gnarled forest. Soon we were enveloped in gloom, the trees blotting out the sky overhead. Any fleeting hope I'd had of escape soon died away completely, replaced by numbing dread. The parking lot and my friends all felt like part of another lifetime now. There would be no rescue or escape from whatever grim fate awaited me. After what felt like an eternity of being dragged across the forest floor, we finally entered into a small, rocky clearing. Looming ahead was an ancient, decomposing cabin. The sight of this ominous structure made my blood run cold. Some primal instinct told me unspeakable horrors lay within. The creature lugged me up the creaking steps of the front porch. I clutched desperately at the weather-worn boards, leaving fingernail marks in the wood, but it did nothing. The front door creaked open, barely hanging from one rusted hinge. The inner darkness seemed to leer out malevolently. The creature stooped down and gripped me under the arms. I struggled uselessly like a caught fish as it hauled me inside effortlessly. We descended a narrow staircase to the cellar below. The stench of earth and decay assaulted my senses in the enclosed space. The monster carelessly released its hold on me and I crumpled to the earthen floor. I knew with dreadful certainty that I would never leave this place alive. The creature let loose a chilling roar of victory and slammed the warped wooden door closed, sealing off the last of the daylight. I was thrown violently to the dirt floor of the damp cellar, the impact knocking the breath from my lungs, and looked up in wide-eyed terror at the nightmarish sight before me. The dark root cellar was illuminated only by thin shafts of daylight penetrating the small, grime-encrusted windows near the ceiling but it was enough to reveal the full horror of my surroundings. Surrounding me were the remains of my friends. Their broken, shredded bodies were strewn haphazardly across the floor, eyes glassy and lifeless. Dark crimson stains covered the earthen floor and spattered the stone walls. 
The overpowering, coppery stench of blood filled the confined space, making my stomach royal and bile rise in my throat. Some of the corpses had been partially devoured, with meat stripped from bone. I gagged, transfixed by the sight of Ryan's mutilated body. His torso was nothing but ravaged ribbons of flesh, and exposed ribs picked clean. This charnel house was the creature's lair, and these severed limbs and gnawed bones were all that remained of my friends. A strangled sob escaped my lips as the full horror sank in. But worse was still to come. A deep snarling vibrated through the cellar. I tore my eyes away from the carnage to see the hulking creature that had orchestrated this massacre looming over me. My mind reeled, unable to comprehend the monstrous being I beheld. It stood at least eight feet tall, powerfully built with corded muscle clearly defined beneath a shaggy covering of coarse fur. Its distorted wolf-like head nearly brushed the low ceiling. Matted fur and dried blood encrusted its elongated snout, framed by jagged fangs. Deep-set eyes reflecting no trace of human-like intellect gazed down at me, devoid of mercy. I recoiled in disbelief and utter terror, clutching myself against the blood-spattered stone wall. This was no ordinary animal, but something unnatural, something evil. The creature opened its jaws wide, strings of saliva dripping. An ear-splitting howl tore from its throat, resonating through the confined space. The bloodthirsty cry jarred me to my core, shattering any futile hope that this beast might show me mercy. Paralyzed by fear, I could only watch as it raised one massively clawed hand, preparing to strike me down as it had my friends. Just as it swung, the deafening sound of a gunshot exploded within the cramped cellar. The creature recoiled with an enraged, agonized roar, clutching its shoulder where dark blood now flowed from the wound. Before it could recover, a second shot echoed. The beast whirled with a snarl towards this new threat. The cellar door splintered inwards under a powerful kick, and a uniformed man burst into the cellar, weapon raised. The ranger fired again at the creature, which had retreated into the darkest corner, still growling furiously like a caged animal. As the shots continued relentlessly driving the wounded beast back, my dread finally began dissolving, overwhelmed by exhausted relief. The monster let loose a furious snarl, baring its jagged fangs, but the ranger fired again without hesitation, the deafening shot echoing painfully in the confined space. The creature flinched from the impact, but continued glaring balefully at the armed man invading its lair. Get back, damn it! the ranger yelled, cycling the pump action to chamber another round. He advanced relentlessly, driving the beast reluctantly back towards the wall. It searched for an escape, muscles tensed, but the ranger had the only exit covered. With a final enraged roar, the wounded monster turned and scrambled up the wooden stairs on all fours. The ranger fired one last blast after it, then cautiously moved to check that the creature had fled. The cabin above remained eerily silent. Holstering his weapon, the ranger turned his attention to me. I still knelt paralyzed against the blood-spattered stone wall, unable to process my unbelievable deliverance from certain death. He approached slowly, hands raised. It's okay, you're safe now. I'm here to help. When I didn't respond, he gently grasped my arm. Hey, look at me. Are you hurt anywhere? I finally met his concerned gaze. I tried to speak but could only manage a strangled croak. My vocal cords seemed frozen in terror. Seeing I was too overwhelmed to answer, the ranger conducted a quick visual survey for injuries and then radioed rapidly for assistance. I need immediate medical transport at my location. Multiple casualties. Very serious. As he relayed details, I remained huddled against the cellar wall, struggling to comprehend that I had miraculously survived this ordeal. But the mangled corpses surrounding me testified that not everyone had been so lucky. When the ranger ended his call, he came back over. When I still couldn't respond coherently, he simply sat beside me in patient silence until the distant throb of helicopters filled the forest. In the following hours, I was transported in a daze from that cursed cabin and flown to the nearest hospital. Doctors checked me from head to toe, but physically at least, I was remarkably unharmed.
Mentally and emotionally was another matter. I learned that most of my friend's ravaged bodies had been recovered from the monster's lair. All except Jen. The search was still ongoing when I was airlifted out. As horrific as it was, I hoped they would find her remains so her family could finally have closure. It's been over 30 long years now since that camping trip, but not a day goes by that I don't think about what happened. Three decades have passed, and still, the nightmares wake me most nights in a cold sweat. I can still hear the screams and still see the pale, lifeless bodies when I close my eyes. Even after all this time, the horror of that weekend haunts me endlessly. My therapist keeps prodding me to make peace with the past, to stop letting it dictate my present. But how can I ever make peace with what I experienced? What we awakened in those woods defies all reason and sanity. Most people don't believe my stories, of course, thinking I'm just another delusional survivor seeking attention. But I know the truth. I've seen the obituaries and news stories labeling it a tragic animal attack, a freak accident. The authorities keep telling me the case is closed forever. Sometimes I'm tempted to just let it go, to try and bury the memories so I can move on with some semblance of a normal life. But I owe it to Mark, Jen, Ryan, and the others to keep searching for answers, to expose the evil that stole their lives and futures. Their families deserve that closure, that truth, no matter how unbelievable. The doctors keep prescribing me new cocktails of medications, as if pills can patch up a shattered psyche. My mother wishes I would just take the pills and numb the pain, but I can't. Crowds and noise overwhelm my frayed nerves too easily. Only nature brings some show of peace, though I'll never set foot in an untamed forest again. Still, a quiet park can take the edge off, letting me find moments of calm. At night I sit outside and wonder if maybe someday the nightmares will stop, if I'll be able to remember my friends without reliving the horror of their deaths. I realize now I didn't truly appreciate the gift of those simple friendships before that thing stole them forever. We take so much for granted, never knowing what precious thing will be ripped away next. I'd give anything to go back and cherish that laughter and light we all shared before the darkness swallowed us whole, but time only flows forward, no matter how desperately we wish otherwise. I often wonder about that creature fleeing the cabin, if it still stalks those woods stalking new prey. Sometimes I think I see its shadow in the corner of my eye, a flash of recognition when I glimpse a stranger on the street. A part of me hopes the ranger finished it off that day so it can't torment more innocent lives, but another part knows those ancient woods are steeped in forces beyond mortal understanding, forces that have existed long before us and will remain long after we're gone. We awaken something better left undisturbed. I may never fully mend, never free myself from the haunting memories, but I have to try and make whatever fragmented recovery this damaged psyche will allow. I owe myself that much, and I owe that much to the people I couldn't save. Maybe someday I'll find a way to live with the ghosts. For now I take each day one at a time and try to appreciate the small moments of light piercing the darkness. It's all any of us can do. Growing up in Ireland, there are many places worthy of exploration with rich histories and beautiful views, and as I've gotten older, friends have often come with me to explore these places. The typical group I go with involves my boyfriend, whom we'll call A, and three of our friends, whom we'll call J, M, and H. At 10.30 p.m. we met up in the local McDonald's car park, each of us decked out in hiking boots, combat trousers, heavy coats, hats, gloves, and torches. We had gotten out to do a final check over our gear to ensure we had spare batteries, pocket knives, rope, and a first aid kit. We took our exploration trip seriously, having encountered our fair share of antisocial groups, and on one occasion, a very angry pigeon that resulted in the small scar above my eyebrow. In our naive minds, we were more than prepared for the night ahead leaving little room for things to go wrong. We had all crammed ourselves into my boyfriend's Land Rover and set off towards our location of the night. 
an 11th century monastic site hidden out in the countryside on a small island in the middle of a lake, reached only by an old rickety bridge. For those who don't know what a monastic site is, it's the location of an old monastery that has since become a ruin. I'd been before, though during the day, and found the place breathtaking, so made the decision to recommend the site to our group. They agreed. Eventually, an hour, five wrong turns, and a loose sheep later, we came to the bridge that led to the ruins. When I call it a bridge, it was in reality little more than rotting planks of wood thrown together to create a 20 meter, 65 feet long walkway that stretched across the shallow lake to the small piece of land home to the monastery. Getting out, we had all made our way across the planks, having to balance ourselves and our gear carefully. But nonetheless, we made it across in one piece, aside from Jay getting his foot stuck between two of the old boards. On the other side, we were met with the shrouded tree line that sheltered our destination, and turning to look back over the bridge, we could no longer see my boyfriend's four-wheeler due to the thick mist that had fallen upon the surrounding area. Despite what you might think, none of us found the area creepy or sensed anything dangerous, not even when we arrived at the actual ruins. In fact, in the pale light of the waxing gibbon moon, the place was beautiful in a mystical way that felt as though you may come across some piece of ancient magic. For the first two hours after our arrival, nothing out of the ordinary happened. We all spread out over the place, seeing it for ourselves, and had found some cool stuff. I had found a cool glass bottle that once had contained whiskey, though was unfortunately completely empty now. And I had found a small smoking pipe that I had proudly set into my backpack as a souvenir of our trip. Things were going smoothly until at about 2 a.m. M began screaming hysterically from the other side of the island. This side of the island was bare of trees or ruins and was nothing more than extremely arid soil, so we had found it odd that M would be over here at all. Running over, we saw her sitting on the ground, her knees pulled tightly against her chest and pointing wildly to a pile of rocks that I had missed on my first inspection of the area. Upon further study, however, it became apparent that it was not a pile of rocks, rather a pile of small but very dead animals. The smallest of these creatures was a little mouse, and the largest, a fox. There were also birds, squirrels, a number of other various rodents, and one tabby cat. These animals had very clearly experienced gruesome deaths, with eyes being gorged out, lacerations along their abdomen and limbs torn off and added neatly to the pile. It is important to note that there are no large predators in Ireland. The biggest you will see are badgers and foxes, or domesticated dogs, but nothing that would have been capable of doing this. This raised alarm bells as it meant whatever had done this was very human. The dead animals stank, but I found it very hard to look away from them and stared on confused. I had been by this area already to check it out, and while it was only a quick look, I had been certain that there was nothing here, no pile of rocks and no bad smell. Now it's entirely possible that I had missed this anomaly and it had been here the whole time, but the flesh of the animals was still perceivably warm and fresh, and I certainly would not have been able to miss that god-awful stench. Was something here while we had been on the other side of the island and left in the time that M came upon the site? We asked M if she had seen anything else, but she was adamant that she had been wanting to take a second look in case she found anything here and instead found the animals and that nothing else had caught her attention or seemed to her as odd. All of us were admittedly a little shaken and creeped out and I felt a nauseous sensation pulling in my chest. We made the decision to head back to the main site of the ruins and grab a bite to eat before heading home. When 4 a.m. came, we had finished up and were preparing to leave the area. The events of two hours ago had been pushed to the backs of our minds, and we were laughing freely at whatever stupid tales H was recounting. Until at least, we all at once picked up on the dead silence of the surrounding area. I'd read about this in other people's stories of when they'd gone hunting and the woods had gone silent, but I'd never experienced it for myself until now. When I say it was silent, I mean there wasn't even a breath of wind or a ripple of water against the shoreline ten meters from us. 
The tree line was mute, and not even crickets seemed to make a noise. This was a silence completely alien to anyone in our group, and immediately, feelings of unease and panic set in. Hey, I think we should speed it up a bit, get home soon. My ma will be barking up my arse if I arrive home when the sun pokes up, said H in a lighter tone, breaking the silence and hauling his rucksack onto his back. I mate, good shout, let's head home, replied A, though in a quieter voice than he usually uses. We had reached the other side of the tree line and to the rickety bridge to return to the car when a loud, aggressive metal banging assumed from the direction of the monastery we had just left behind. We all froze. Turning back to the tree line, we stared on in fear. J, H, and I had pulled out our pocket knives, and we were all shining our torches carefully along the dark line of vegetation, searching for any movement. It was this very moment that my life changed. I saw what was upon first glance only a shadow, but bringing my torch to light it up again, it was very clearly the figure of a very tall, very lanky man. He must have been around six, seven and stood hunched. This man had no discernible features nor clothes and was completely shrouded in darkness, despite the light of my torch shining on him. In his arm, he carried something long and sharp and it hung loosely at his side, grazing the ground beneath him. But what scared me the most was his flesh. It was lacerated entirely and even charred in places, rotting away from his bones. He was missing his left arm and his lips had seemingly rotted off to reveal a gaping hole of a mouth. He had no eyes, only torn flesh around his sockets, suggesting that they had been carved out, just like the animals. I didn't know I was screaming until a hand clamped over my mouth and a panicked voice cried my name. What the hell is wrong with you? Why are you screaming? There's nothing there. It was A. I stopped and turned to face him. They all had a worried look on their faces, clearly thinking I had gone mental. There, can't you see him? He's right there. I had been yelling, pointing angrily at the man, who had not moved an inch. They didn't see him. All they saw was the empty tree line and their friend on the verge of a breakdown over something not there at all. So I stopped. The drive back to the McDonald's car park was silent, and no one spoke a word of goodbye to one another as we parted ways. A drove me home, and when he pulled up outside my house, he grabbed my hand. Look, I don't know what you think you saw back there, but I swear we didn't see anything. We were all hyped up and a little bit freaked out. It could have been a trick of the torchlight. Get some rest. I'll see you tomorrow, he said, kissing me gently on the head. I believed him. He was probably right after all, so I decided not to think on it anymore, until last week when I had a dream about the island. Three nights ago, as of writing this, I made A take me back. We arrived at the other other side of the bridge at 8.15 p.m., and I saw nothing. Deciding it wasn't enough, I continued on to the ruins, against A's pleading for me to leave. The second I got to the monastery, a wave of rotting flesh hit my senses, and it took all my strength not to empty my stomach there and then. I forced myself to look around, and at first I saw nothing, but as I turned back to leave, I saw, put at the corner of my eye, a tall figure standing by the collapsed stone. I didn't dare face it. I don't think I could have even if I wanted to. Ignorance is bliss, right? I regret going back to that place. A still swears up and down that he saw nor smelt anything on the first or second times we were at this place, but I know what I saw and felt. I don't take any type of drugs or medication, and I'm not prone to mental episodes. I was very much aware of my surroundings. What was there felt very real. Despite this, every part of me wants to see it as a figment of my imagination and move on, but I can't. I refuse to call it a ghost, as M jokingly called it, or a spirit or a demon. I don't know what it was, but it felt like death itself had shown its face to me. I haven't been able to sleep the past three nights and I've barely eaten. I don't know how to process what I've seen. If anyone at all could offer me some advice or insight, I would really appreciate it. This is a story about my Wendigo encounter in While Hunting in the Ozarks of Missouri. 
This story takes place four years ago during the rifle season of 2019. At the time, I was 20 years old, about to turn 21. As a birthday present, my dad decided to go hunting with me. I was pleased by this because he's always busy, and I don't get to talk with him as much as I want to to. So I spent the week before opening day and went to bed eagerly. That morning, though, I got a call from my mom. Hey, daughter. I'm using daughter to not reveal my name. Sorry, but your father has just came down sick. He said he isn't going to make the hunting trip. Naturally, I was upset by this and just got ready to go hunting after hanging up. I had, after all, spent all week preparing. It would be a waste not to go now. So I got ready, grabbed my rifle, and hopped in my pickup. When I got set up in my stand, it was pitch black out still, and decided to close my eyes for a bit. And for those non-hunters listening, you want to try and get out to your stand while it's still dark, when the deer are still hunkered down. That way, you're not scaring them away. So I was sitting in the stand with my eyes closed. I started hearing footsteps, and was confused by the steps. The steps made it sound bipedal, and sounded really heavy, unnatural. I lived in the Ozarks my whole life, and my parents often joked about me acting more like a boy as a child. I was constantly in the woods and getting dirty, so I feel like I have a right to call myself a knowledgeable person about these woods. This was not normal. Suggently, my dad's voice ran Damji out from the darkness. Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Can you tell me where you are? This confused me in a number of ways, as my dad is a joking, carefree guy and would have done his best to sneak up on me and grab my foot or something. Also. He knows where the deer stand is, as he's the one who put it up, and we haven't changed its location once, as it never fails to provide does and bucks to shoot at. And on top of all that, the voice was wrong. It was emotionless and monotone, and sounded more like a recording instead of actually coming from him. So I sat motionless, eyes wide open now, and looking around the dark forest trying to see anything, if I could see what it was at all because I knew what it was. Six, I listen to this podcast regularly and know of Wendigos and Skinwalkers being able to mimic people's voices, including your loved ones. My heart started pounding as I silently started panicking. I was trapped. If I was discovered, I wouldn't be able to outrun this thing and my rifle started feeling useless. Then, I stifled a gasp as I saw a shadowy humanoid figure appear from the darkness. I couldn't make any features out except unnaturally long arms that brushed against the ground as it took heavy steps in the dry fallen leaves of fall. It looked around. Zane walked past my stand, repeating the same thing over and over again. Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Can you tell me where you are? I stay in my tree stand long after the, the thing had passed, and I waited till the sun came up to get back to my truck. While I was walking through the forest, I felt like I was being watched, and I kept hearing sticks and branches break. It felt like hours before I got to my truck, I got in, and quickly started it up. I looked into the rearview mirror, and now have a memory burned into my mind from that one look. A tall, pale figure, leaning out from behind a tree, watching me leave before letting out what sounded like an angry and unnatural scream. I then let go of the steering wheel and covered my ears instinctively before quickly grabbing it and jerking it to the right as I about hit a tree. My heart pounding in my chest, I drove back home where slowly recounted the events in my mind. This hasn't changed my love for the woods, and I still hunt that area to this day. I've never experienced this again though, and my dad did end up having COVID, but pulled through and went hunting with me the year after this experience. This is the first time sharing this story, as my parents have always just laughed when I talked about cryptic topics. So as I write this, I feel like I'm taking a heavy weight off my shoulders. So I say this, no matter how well you think you know your woods or hunting area, just know that there is thing by A out there that can make you rethink your entire thoughts about your woods. Nestled in the uncharted depths of Tennessee's rugged mountains, my home is a realm of secrets unknown to many. 
Vast hills, imposing cliffs and seemingly endless hollows stretch far beyond state borders, concealing a rich tapestry of history unbeknownst to most outsiders. The story I share delves into one such concealed narrative. In this remote expanse, there exists a section of forest-blanketed mountains known to the locales as Hoboken Mountain. Yet, to the natives entrenched in the region, they refer to it as the forest that takes. This place is shrouded in mystique, echoing a tale that transcends mere names and taps into a hidden history veiled beneath the shadows of ancient hills and cliffs that seem to stretch into eternity. Long ago, colonists ventured deeper into unexplored territories, their aspirations fixated on the coveted expanse, now currently known as Hoboken Mountain. Extensive surveys of the region unveiled a panorama of allure. A wealth of animals, abundant resources, and fertile grounds promising bountiful harvests. This mountainous haven not only satisfied their immediate needs, but strategically positioned became a linchpin for further settlements. The colonists, driven by dreams of prosperity, saw in Hoboken Mountain not merely a plot of land, but a key to unlocking the untold potential of their burgeoning community. During this era, the indigenous people and the newly arrived colonists existed in a state of mutual coexistence. However, as news spread of the colonists' intentions to settle in the foothills of Hoboken Mountain, a shift in the delicate cohabitation occurred. The native inhabitants, rather than adopting a hostile stance, chose a path of caution and concern. Sensing an impending disturbance, they earnestly warned the newcomers to steer clear of that particular terrain, their voices carrying a wisdom rooted in a fear and superstition for the darkness that lingered in Hoboken Mountain. Unfazed by warnings and superstitions, the resolute colonists, driven by prospects, forged ahead with their settlement construction, occasional skirmishes with native groups and sabotage, motivated by fear of the ominous consequences of trespassing on the cursed ground, failed to impede their progress. Undeterred, the settlers successfully constructed their settlement, laying the foundation for the founding of a town. Numerous tales shroud the generations during which this settlement endured, none of them positive, and all lacking any corroborating evidence. The lore weaves a dense narrative of misfortune, otherworldly affliction, and mysterious disappearances. Depending on the storyteller, the consensus emerges that the settlement was ultimately abandoned, surrendered to the relentless embrace of the encroaching forest. Presently, locals caution against venturing near those woods. While not everyone heeds the warning, any seasoned hunter understands the unspoken wisdom. Avoid those woods, and if you go, do so in a group. The unwritten rule for Hoboken Mountain is clear. Never defy the rule of the two. Always ensure they're in a pair or more, never fewer. In the summer of the 97, I foolishly defied the cardinal rule. While the Amazon is dubbed the Green Inferno, those acquainted with the Tennessee Mountains in summer would argue it's the true green inferno, an expansive realm of mountains and trees. Once inside, the sky vanishes and orientation fades. Raised in these woods, I'd hunted them for years, familiar with the Hoboken mountain range. However, that summer marked my first solo expedition. Originally planned with three fellow hunters, unforeseen circumstances left me alone. Ignoring better judgment and swayed by a misplaced confidence, I ventured into the woods alone. Driving my truck down the dirt road leading to the Hoboken Forest entry, I left it at the road's end, commencing my trek. Standing at the precipice where dirt met tree line, the forest seemed to hold its breath in anticipation as I crossed the threshold into the woods. Embarking on the trek to a familiar hunting spot, a location of past success, required a two-hour hike. Initially, the forest teemed with life, birds, bugs, squirrels, the vibrant symphony of nature. However, as I delved deeper, an unsettling unease settled in. Despite knowing the terrain well, I felt an unnatural disconnect with my surroundings. The cliché sensation of being watched manifested profoundly on this hike. With about 30 minutes remaining, I decided to pause, settling on a rock for a sip of coffee from my thermos. I glanced down and discovered several drops of blood on a leaf. 
Realization struck as I recognized the source, a cut on my arm. The scene took an eerie turn as a flock of butterflies gracefully descended, landing on the leaf and engaging in a bizarre struggle over prodding the blood droplets with their proboscis. Lost in a surreal trance, I gazed at the bizarre butterflies. A sudden snap jolted me, but as I turned there was nothing. When I looked back, both the butterflies and the blood droplets had vanished. Shrugging off the ominous feeling, I pressed on with my hike, reaching the spot where we had set up a deer stand years earlier. Upon entering, I found myself overlooking a picturesque clearing, cut through by a stream flowing down from the mountain. The scene was enchanting, a perfect spot to patiently await a deer. Within an hour, a massive buck emerged into the clearing. Slowly raising my rifle and peering through the scope, I had him in my crosshairs when he abruptly jerked his head towards the tree line. Something had spooked him, and he bolted before I could take the shot. Swinging my scope towards the disturbance, I observed movement in the bushes, a pinkish blur that gradually revealed itself. What emerged was beyond horror. My heart and lungs seemed to halt in fear. In the clearing stood a naked, dirt-covered duplicate of myself, staring directly up at me with a malevolent, gaping smile of rotted, blackened teeth. Lowering my gun, I aimed to scrutinize the naked figure of myself with my own eyes, without the distance of the scope potentially distorting my observation. However, in the brief span it took for me to lower the scope and my eyes to adjust, it simply vanished. Disturbed and disoriented, I sat frozen. The forest, once filled with the lively chorus of nature, now felt oppressive and eerily silent. The unsettling encounter left me grappling my own sanity. I cautiously descended into the clearing, with rifle in hand, where the bizarre apparition had stood. The air seemed charged with an otherworldly energy. Every hair on my body stood on end, a primal fear enveloping me. I felt hunted, akin to the buck. Suddenly, a human-like guttural roar echoed from beyond the tree line. Without hesitation, I turned and sprinted. The dense forest, once familiar, now felt like an ominous labyrinth closing in on me, covering the two-hour hike in nearly half the time. Gasping for breath, I emerged from the trees onto the dirt road, hands planted on my truck's hood as if seeking refuge in a twisted game of tag. In my peripheral vision, a massive black form shifted behind a tree in the direction I'd exited the woods. Glancing back, I saw a single hand, grotesquely human in form, clung to the bark before vanishing behind the tree. I hastily climbed into my truck, leaving a trail of dust in my wake putting Hoboken Mountain in my rearview mirror. The encounter was unlike anything I've ever faced before or since that day. While I struggle to fully comprehend or accept what happened, I'll share this insight. The world harbors ancient mysteries even still in modern times, and in those aged corners relics of a long-forgotten world may stir and come to life. Beware of old places with old tales, for those stories may linger on very much alive. I'll start out by saying that I can't officially confirm what I saw, but it was as real as real gets for me. I don't usually think much of the supernatural, but this really changed my perspective. I'm currently 22, but I was 21 at the time this happened. I spent the summer of 2022 working in southwestern Oregon. I had taken a summer off from Wildland Fire for a good paying job baling hay for a custom hay company. It was mid-August, and they had me in a New Holland T7-260 with two other tractors in the field that night. We did most of our meadow hay baling at night, as you have to be careful about the moisture of grass hay when baling, or else it can spontaneously combust when stacked. I was working on the west end of the field while the other two tractors were on the east end, making their way towards me. It was probably around midnight or 1 a.m. I was going along jamming out to some Credence Clearwater Revival when my baler got plugged. The hay had bunched up in front of the feeder drum. I was probably going too fast for the conditions or ran across a wet spot. The field was flood irrigated, so it wasn't too uncommon to find some hay that hadn't dried completely. I climbed out of the tractor to deal with the plug, 
pulling out handfuls of hay until the baler would take the pile. The tractor had a bunch of auxiliary lights, so the area around it was well lit. I never liked the dark, but I felt fairly safe. I was probably two windrows in from the edge of the field at the time. The fence lines around the field had tall canary grass growing at least six foot tall where the swathers couldn't get to. This had always bothered me for some reason, but I'm from eastern Washington, so I'm used to being able to see for a ways out. As I'm laying in the hay trying to unplug my baler, I heard the grass at the edge of the field moving. I looked but didn't see anything. I just figured it was an animal or something. Didn't think anything of it. After I got the baler unplugged, I hopped back into the tractor and kept going. It wasn't too long after that I happened to see a coyote at the edge of where my lights were shining. Again, I didn't think anything of it. Fast forward about 20 minutes, I see a coyote again, still hanging out just outside of the range of the work lights of my tractor. I started thinking about it, how bold it was, getting that close to my tractor. Around 3 a.m., I had a shear bolt break on the baler. It's a simple fix. It's just a bolt that goes through the flywheel of the baler that's designed to break if there's too much strain on it kind of a safety feature to make sure you don't damage the baler itself. I went out to change out the bolt when I hear something. It sounds like a voice, but I can't quite make it out. I try and hurry up with the shear bolt replacement. As I finish up and am closing the shield on the baler, I hear it again. It kind of sounds like one of my friends who was driving one of the tractors on the other side of the field. I looked, but both sets of headlights were still moving. I was starting to freak out at this point. There shouldn't be anyone out here at 3 a.m. We're five miles down a gravel road from a town of like 40 people. I started rushing towards the tractor and climbed the steps. The voice is getting louder, calling my name. I get in and slam the door shut behind me. As I'm putting the tractor in gear, I look out the door. At the edge of where my lights are shining is what looks like a coyote. Something's wrong with it, though. It looks really mangy, and the eyes aren't shining the right color. They almost look crimson red. On its face is what almost resembles a smile. Then it stands up on its hind legs and tries to take a clumsy step in my direction. Once I saw this, I dumped the clutch and kept on moving. Up until the sun came up, every time I looked in the mirror, I could see a coyote staying just beyond the lights of my tractor, just like it had before. As the sun was coming up over the mountain next to us, I saw it start running back towards the tall grass at the end of the field. I radioed the other guys in the other tractors, but they didn't know what I was talking about. Thank God I didn't have a plug up or another shear bolt break after that. I don't know what I saw or heard that night, but that wasn't the last of it. Several nights later we had gotten rained out so I was able to sleep at night instead of during the day. It was in the bunkhouse. I was on the second floor on my bunk bed. I had just woken up around 4 a.m. and couldn't get back to sleep. Once I'm up, I'm up. I was laying in bed, scrolling through TikTok when I heard a scratching on the window. Like I said, this is the second floor. There are also no trees near the building. It was then that I heard that same damn voice trying to mimic one of my co-workers who wasn't even in town that night. After about 20 minutes, it went silent again. That's the last I've heard of whatever that was, and I hope I never have to deal with that again. I don't know exactly what it was, but I've heard stories of similar creatures, so I wonder if it might have been a skinwalker. Hey, my dear friends. If you're finding joy in our content and would like to support our channel, please contemplate subscribing and hitting that like button. Your support means the world to us, and will enable us to bring forth more captivating and fresh content. And a beautiful comment, as striking as the beauty of your eyes, my handsome friend, would truly touch our hearts.